On today's show, execution cost the Cavs against the Heat. But does it, and does this game tell us anything about how these teams can match up in the playoffs? We'll discuss that and more on today's Locked on Cavs. You are Locked on Cavs, your daily Cleveland Cavaliers podcast. Welcome into Locked On Cavs. I'm Chris Manning. That's Evan Damerald. This is your team every day here covering all things Cleveland Cavaliers. Jake Stevens, as always, on production. Evan, to start with Cavs today, 107 to 104 Cavs loss. Both teams pretty banged up. Both teams really not at 100%. We'll get to what that means about what we can learn from it as we get into the show. But I think I, I think the place to start is there's two things execution-wise, that I think cost the Cavs late in this game. Really three, but I, to me, there are kind of two big ones. Well, there's really three big ones. Number one, I think the challenge call on the Rogier four-point play that cost them a timeout that then set up them not having a timeout to advance the ball with under five seconds left to get up a last-second heave was, was ultimately a mistake. Number two, you have the Rogier make over a core, which I thought was just a really good tough make on a well-defended shot. And then secondly, thirdly, excuse me, it's late, they could not execute and get a more than a two uh, when we're on the last bucket they had uh, before they started playing the free throw game. They tried to get a three for Darius Garland or someone else, ended up being a George Yang layup that then again puts him into just play the, the foul game territory and sets up that heave. So execution to me is the story of the game. Not enough execution late to get this one over the hump. What stood out to you? Uh, I mean, everything you laid out, if we go through it bit by bit, the first off, like Isaac Okoro's defense on Terry Rozier, I think was very good in that final possession, as you had noted. But it's a tip of the cap situation. It's really good defense, even better offense. Just, you know, Terry Rozier just continues to have the God-given ability to just get red hot whenever he comes home to face the Cavs. Um, makes you wonder how good his stats would be if he played for the Cavs. He'd be a perennial MVP, and maybe the Cavs go 41 at home if he's in Cleveland every single time. But either way, um, the late game execution for me is just like the biggest thing that kind of stood out out of just everything you highlighted, and I agree on everything. But like, it was and continues to be kind of just like a continual issue with this lack of timeouts and i think that challenge is a little bit ill-advised on jb bakerstaff's part that did cost in that timeout that they probably could have used you know yeah. the power of hindsight being 2020 but um the fact that i wasn't at the game covering this game in person but jb bakerstaff did say post game like the plan was to get a look for sam merrill or darius garland depending on how miami's defense is reacting and it was pretty explicitly clear that miami was not going to let up any three pointers and you saw karis levert dribbling into the paint kind of looking for an answer as the heat were defending him pretty well we're trying not to foul him he kicks it out to niang who was collapsed on on the perimeter but not collapsed on enough where miami fouled him he then drove to the basket and <clears throat> I, I just think like if you're Miami, you'll take George and Yang driving to the basket nine times out of ten on the final late game possession versus like a Sam Merrill three pointer or a Darius Garland three pointer or even Karis LeVert from three as well. Like, or even George and Yang too, if you got a wide open look out there on the perimeter. But like, you're settling for that because you know Yang's not going to force a ton of contact. He's not going to at least draw that contact to get the free throw line and convert it to an and one opportunity. But yeah, that was just a little bit of a chaotic fracas. And then when that didn't really go the way you wanted, you are forced to foul. Rozier makes both. And then you have to go the full length of the court in less than three seconds, I believe. And it's just, you know, not, not great late game execution. It's just the Cavs continue to struggle to find a rhythm and whether it's, you know, tactically or just on the court, like they, they struggle to find a rhythm. Uh, especially post All Star break, just in late game execution moments. Yeah, and look that that maybe looks different if you don't have if you have Mitchell. I mean, I think Mitchell at the end of the game, you're at least getting up a clean shot if he's around, if he's there. That's mm. something. I but I think just the fact that it those things add up, I think, is the issue. It's not just that like one thing 
totally happens or one thing doesn't happen. I think it's all those things together cost you. Like you can have one of those things not go your way in a close game and still get out of it. Like you're gonna think you're gonna make mistakes. No one plays a perfect clean game, but I think when mm-hmm. you stack those three things on top of each other in rapid succession, that's how you get here. That's how you get to to losing this game. You're down by ten by as many as ten in the fourth. You come all the way back. You have a lot of the energy on your side, and it's just the little things at the end. Maybe you ran out of gas. Maybe it's just the personnel not up to it. Whatever it is, I think it costs you. Um, Evan, before we get into segment two, I want to ask you one kind of meta question about this a little bit. Sure. But segment two is going to be all about, okay, what would this playoff matchup tell us? What would this, as a possible first-run series, what would that look like? When you look at this game, considering Bam Adebayo didn't play, Duncan Robinson didn't play, Kevin Love didn't play, Donovan Mitchell didn't play, Max Struess didn't play, Evan Mobley didn't play, Dean Wade didn't play. Neither team is close to fully healthy in this game. What do you feel like you can actually take away from this and then apply it forward about what a series between these two teams might look like? It could get a lot uglier. I think there were moments that this game turned into a stone fight especially in the third quarter um and it it, again to your point like neither team was at full strength of the heat did have jimmy butler in this matchup which i think is the arguably the best player on the court for either team um but outside of that like the heat were missing plenty of players the Cavs are missing plenty of players which we can touch on the injuries if we can depending on the flow of the conversation but I think it would be a bit of a grind for Cleveland, no matter what, especially if Miami does get like another plus plus defender in Bam Adebayo. Um, Kevin Love can be a floor spacer and can be very tricky and just has that vet savvy. And also just like tactically speaking, you still have Eric Spolster versus JB Bickerstaff. And if you're Cleveland, you don't really have the advantage in that particular matchup or assignment either. So it would be a bit of a maybe trick. Uh, but I wouldn't feel better about the Cavs facing the Heat in the first round versus like them drawing the Pacers or even the Magic in the first round. Well, I, to like kind of answer my question specifically, I think it's that it's hard to take away a ton from these games, and we also just know what the Heat are. Correct. Yeah. Like well, we we already we we no one say? really seems to know who the Heat are because they just the dead never die. No, I never saw them making the NBA Finals last year. Right. Like the Heat are a certain thing they figure out how to do it over and over and over again so we know that this game was really physical like this game had in person like had a a bit of chippiness to it it wasn't the prettiest game it was often very ugly like that all of that is what this would look like i think seeing okay how do the Cavs deal with what what bam does in the season he's having how does that look i mean there's no even mobley so how does this what would this look like with two bigs versus one big like there's lots of things where it's hard to like extract it. What I do feel like we know is kind of what I think we would just assume going in, which is it'll be really physical. It'll be grimy. It'll be tough that the margins will be really thin. I was talking to Lockdown Heat's Wes Goldberg over text during this game. And A, I was like, Wes, Terry Rozier is going to win this game. That's what's going to happen. And I was correct because <laughs> that's just like predict that. To, I don't deserve any credit for that, but that's just like, it, that's just what happens with him in Cleveland, as you said before. And he's just like, the Heat can't help but play really close games and crunch time games. That's just what they do. So, like, if this, if this, the fact that this ended up as a three point game that came down to the last two minutes is just like the least surprising thing in the world. The, the tone of this game being as grimy as it was, being as close as it was, as competitive as it was, that doesn't surprise me. Like, this felt like a, a, a game against the Miami Heat. And if you, and if you said this is, uh, versions of this game or what you saw over a possible seven in a first round series would not shock me at all. Right, after this, though, let's talk about how would this match about like how would you feel if this was three six, let's say round one, Cavs Heat, what that would look like. We'll talk the, about the, that. Well, the, the Knicks are only a game and a half back for three, so let's not say it's three six quite yet, my friend. Okay, I, I'm just Evan, I'm just saying hypothetically, it's just a okay. hypothetical. What does okay. this look like? As far as the series goes, we'll touch on that after this. Today's episode is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. What brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. 
eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more, whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay's guaranteed fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Plus, with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit is only available to U.S. customers. I want to remind you, too, that Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel. Locked On Sports today. Baseball fans, mark your calendar for March 20th at 7 p.m. Eastern time for the best MLB season preview coming exclusively to Locked On Sports today. On March 20th at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, be the first to get the local insight from MLB local experts of the Locked On Podcast Network. Find it on March 20th at 7 p.m. Eastern Time on the Locked On Sports Today 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube or free on the Amazon Fire TV channels app. Evan, let's just say it's 3-6. I understand the Knicks could get into this. I understand the Cavs, like, the Bucks didn't beat, the Bucks did have Giannis and lost to the Celtics. The Cavs are closer to two for the record than they are to four for, like, whatever that is worth. Like, they, this is not, none of this is very set yet without, with a little bit less than a month ago of the regular season. The Heat, I mean, for instance, are the eight seed right now. If the season ended today, it would be Cavs Sixers run one, and we'll, we'll talk, be able to talk about that in the future as well. But let's just say it's Cavs Heat. How would you feel about it? What, what would your feeling be about what this could look like? Not great if you are rooting for the Cleveland Cavaliers in that matchup. I just, the Miami Heat just have the pressure points. And sure, as you would know, like Evan Mobley could be very much an X factor um, in that series between Cleveland and Miami. Uh, just the big to big matchup with you know Bam being the lone matchup or lone contender for Miami in terms of defense, and then you have Mobley and Allen. But the cynic in me says like, well, how rusty is Mobley when he's back on the court? Does he get back sooner? Is he back closer to the playoffs? Like, is it going to be thrown back into the fire like Isaac Okoro was last year? Like that gives me pause. Uh, Jimmy Butler cranking up the intensity on Darius Garland gives me pause. Donovan Mitchell, whose knee we don't know if or will be strong enough to carry him in the postseason, gives me pause. Eric Spolster just kind of masterfully having the you know acumen of one of the best coaches in the NBA. I think the and best the, coach in the NBA, like the but that's the best coach in the NBA. Uh, Mark Dagno is doing pretty well too with the Thunder this year, but also the okay, Thunder is just really he, good. But okay, okay, just hold on a second. Mark Dag Dagno is a great coach. He is not a better coach. Than Eric, like he's going to win Coach of the Year. He is not a better coach than Eric Spolstra. Like he's just not. Well, okay, Coach of the Year. It's either like him or Mike Malone, in my opinion. So yeah, but is he? But I don't think he's a. Doesn't matter. He's not a better coach than Eric Spolstra. Well, he lost a championship like, series to Malone recently, but neither here nor there. Um, this would be the. I, I said it in the last segment. If you had to like chalk it up between Miami, Indiana, or Orlando. You'd feel a lot more comfortable if you're a Cleveland. Sure, we have recency bias just based on the latest Pacers game on our side a little bit too, but you feel a little bit better if you're Cleveland heading into a 3-6 matchup against Orlando or Indiana than you would the Miami Heat just because the Heat just kind of have won that battle-tested experience and they also just have those pressure points to hit the Cavs that aren't going to likely be 100% when the playoffs roll around. Even if they are like 100% yeah. depth wise, just like everyone may not be ship shape because they're still kind of figuring out their way or whatever. Yeah, this this is the one that if you're the Bucks, if you're the Cavs, if you're like, this is the one, if you're the Celtics of the one seed, like this is the team you don't want in the first round. What would be interesting to me about it is is twofold. Number one, tactically just how it gets kind of sorted out. I think how the Cavs deal with a team that's like, not obviously the same as the Knicks, but built from the same cloth and beat the Knicks last year in terms of toughness would be really interesting. Um, the Evan Mobley part of it in itself would be fascinating because I there's a what if you go back to last year, something the Cavs did against Miami that had a lot of success was they put Evan Mobley and Jimmy Butler, and Evan Mobley defended Jimmy Butler. He roamed off of him, and he was able to recover 
and defend him mm-hmm. and do a really good job defending Jimmy. And, and Mobley, one of his biggest strengths as a defender is not fouling. And Jimmy Butler, what does he do? He draws a lot of fouls. So if that's a way the series tilts, that could be really fascinating to watch. But is Mobley healthy? Is he ready to go? What does it look like? The other part of this that I think would be interesting is if you're Cleveland, like this season is about how far can you take this? How far can you improve on what was such a disappointment last year, right? I think in a world you'd say, okay, can we just get the Magic in round one? Can we get Indiana in round one and have a softer landing spot and just get to round two? And then it's like, you can't control it at that point. You're getting Giannis, you're getting whomever. There would be something really interesting about saying, okay, Cleveland, it's put up or shut up time. You get Miami in round one. Can you exercise what went wrong last year? Can you do something better than last year? Can you prove that you are better than last year? And just getting that out of the way in round one, to me, would be fascinating. I also just assume it would go seven games, and then J.B. Bickerstaff, if he had hair, would pull it all out by the time this, this series ended. Do you think Heat Cavs it go seven games? I think it's possible. Like, I, I just... Yeah, it's my, po- like, anything's possible. I don't think that. Yeah. I think it'd go five, maybe six tops in favor of Miami because... You said the Knicks are cut from a similar cloth. I think they aren't like as offensive. Them as in the Heat aren't as offensive rebound heavy, but like they could write up a similar script where they can mitigate the impact of Mobley or Allen, one of the two, just kind of make it a little bit easier on their front line. And then they really just frustrate Mitchell and prevent Mitchell from getting in a rhythm, rhythm the entire series and just put everything on the shoulder of Darius Garland to say like, okay, Darius. Beat us without your co-star in the backcourt. He is not going to be your safety blanket or bust the pressure valve for you. Like, can you carry the load? And well, that that's a fair question. Can he carry the load? Like, the optimist in me wants to say yes, but just with how Miami's equipped and how like they can kind of hit those pressure points specifically does make me wonder. Like, can they kind of flip the script? But I agree with you. Like, if Cleveland and the basketball gods are real, you're really hoping and or praying at the altar of whomever um and the basketball pantheon um just to maybe draw a more favorable matchup and maybe sliding out of three is that more favorable matchup you get a four or five toss instead and it's like sixers or magic instead of maybe having to deal with the team that uh won the play in tournament and like you like you're the two seed in that scenario you draw miami in the first round like maybe you want to avoid that as much as possible at this point and with, you know, 15 or so games to go, maybe that's kind of the strategy going forward is on top of just, you know, try and get as healthy as possible. I don't think playing the seeding game at this point, it's just, I, I don't think you have enough like bandwidth with all the injuries you have. And oh, like, no, what, and also there's games too to many go. games left. Yeah. Well, there's not like there's just like that's that's both like a good amount of games and also not a lot of games. You don't like you kind of just got to like win. I think at this point, I think that's kind of the most important thing is just be healthy and try to win. And, like, if you end up as the three seed, great. If you end up as the two seed, great. If you fall to four because the Knicks get really hot and you have some bad losses, great. You just kind of kind of – I think your hand right now is just – if you're Cleveland specifically because of all the injuries you have, I don't – worrying about the things you can't control and trying to, like, manipulate things in your favor is just, like, asking for the – the for James Naismith to, like, come out of the sky and be, like, spite you. Like, that – like – and for what it's worth right now, if you look at betplayoffstatus.com and look at their breakdown and look at their odds, Cavs still have the high are the highest probability of ending up as the three seed. 34% chance of being the three seed. That's higher than everybody else. Only a 27% chance of getting up to the two seed. The most likely team to get the six seed is the Miami Heat at 29%. Indiana's at a second and that at 25%. Philly, 17%. So that's where this is at. Like, this is like a very feasible, not locked in. You know, the Heat have to like do their part. The Cavs have to do their part, whatever. This is a very possible playoff matchup. It's it's very much on yeah. the table. Oh, it's absolutely on the table. But to what I was trying to say before, like, yeah, you can't play the numbers game this far out the regular season. But like, once you have a clearer picture of it, maybe that's where it comes into play. But yeah, trying to win is obviously the most optimal outcome especially just depending on upsets that help and happen elsewhere you could have home court advantage in the second round of the playoffs too and god willing if you're able to get to that point the conference finals as well if you're able to get to there but this game had some good moments in it overall i i just have my questions on how far a seven game series could go 
And if you held a gun to my head and ask me right now, my mood could change between now and when they play on Sunday, of course. But like just right now, just based on how they've played against Miami this season, I'd go Heat in five or six if they face the Cavs in the first round. And it would be a grimy, ugly, physical five or six. But I think Miami just kind of has a little bit more griminess and ugliness to them to kind of make the Cavs un- more uncomfortable than they want to be. But, so would you, it's, so if, as it seems we've done this exercise so far, Indiana would be the preferable one. Miami is at, would be at the bottom. Yeah, I think that is my ranking right now. Yeah, I think that's like the only object rank, ranking, frankly. Well, it depends um, on how you feel about Orlando. You might want to toss Orlando ahead of Indiana, too. But the, the Pacers are just such a weird team post-playing tournament or uh, in-season tournament. in-season tournament that, like, I can't cannot get a temperature check on them because, like, they, they were pretty good tonight um, in their win. And the other night against the Cavs, they were pretty dreadful. So I can't figure them out. Yeah, uh, it's also the worst. Frankly, this is the worst month of the NBA season, if I'm being honest. So that's it's hard sometimes to sort through what we're seeing and reacting to. All right, that's it for Cavs Heat. We'll discuss that more. They play again on Sunday. We'll recap that one for you from South Beach. Not from there specifically. The Cavs will be there. We will not be there. Uh, but up next, JB Bickerstaff pre post pregame talked about sports winning. He was asked about it. He had some very strong thoughts. Eric Spolster did as well. This comes on the heels of Tyrese Halliburton's recent comments about uh, messages received and seeing a psychologist to sort through some of the things people say to him online over sports betting. Let's see how we feel about that and, frankly, just how people should behave sometimes with this stuff after this. Today's episode is brought to you by Nissan. Nissan... Are you thinking? Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little bit further? Ever wonder what adventure could be around the next corner? Our friends at Nissan have a lineup of SUVs with the capabilities to take your adventure to the next level. The 2024 Nissan Rogue is perfect for city drives and great escapes. There's class exclusive Google built in. You're always updating assistant to call on for almost anything. Gone are the days of connecting your phone. Google Assistant, Google Maps, and Google Play Store are built right in to the 12.3-inch HD touchscreen infotainment system. The 2024 Rogue is the perfect mid midsize crossover for your next adventure. Nissan's incredible lineup also includes the 2024 Nissan Pathfinder, which has room for up to eight in expansive cargo capacity and advanced available 4x4 capability. With 284 horsepower and up to 6,000 pounds of towing, that's a lot, when adventure calls, the Pathfinder is there to answer take the nissan rogue nissan pathfinder or nissan armada and go find your next big adventure shop at nissanusa.com all right last segment so jb bicker steph game had a bunch of comments a friend of the program justin flickinger and i we i knew he was going to ask about this like to i want to pull the curtain back on this kind of like fully just to like think about how this stuff works sometimes text me during the day on wednesday and it's like how would you frame this question and we talk through it he asked it, and it it's. I think it's going to continue to be a bigger conversation because on top of like what Hal Burton said this week and what the JB said today and what Spolster said, you have the Shohei Otani situation with the Dodgers where they fired his translator who had worked a long time for um, some illegal for money from taking money from Shohei and placing bets with an illegal bookie. Like there's just this is there's been some stuff with Temple basketball, I believe, and unusual betting patterns. Like this is not going to be the last time. We hear about this. We've seen this overseas where you had Premier League players get suspended. Um, I'm not like this. This is like more of an emotional human thing, but this is all kind of a complicated subject. We also should just know like we have a betting sponsor. We have we are partnered with FanDuel here at Locked On. And like I personally do do some sports betting. I think Evan does sometimes as well. JB Bickerstaff said this quote, I personally have had my own instances with sports gamblers where they got my telephone number and were sending me crazy messages about where I live and my kids and all that stuff. It's a dangerous game, a fine line that we're walking for sure. He added, quote, it brings added pressure. It brings a distraction to the game that can be difficult for players, coaches, referee, everybody is involved in that. I think we really have to be careful with how we clo- how close we let it get to the game and the security of the people who are involved in it because it does carry a weight. The last thing he said was, quote, I understand the business of it. It is something that I believe has gone too far. End quote. Post game, Jared Allen and Darius Garland both said that they have. Well, Jared said it. Darius just kind of not along in agreement. 
uh, that they have gotten messages in their DMs with people being really mad about their parlays and their bets and all of that, which is not, which is like the least shocking thing that anyone has said about this. Evan, there's a lot going on here. This is a naughty subject. This is a complicated subject, I think, in a lot of ways. What do you feel about how we're seeing in the Cleveland sense, J.B. Bickerstaff most vehemently talk about how betting has gotten uncomfortable and close and, and affected him and, and the team in some way? I mean, it's not a naughty or touchy subject if you're one of the degenerates that's harassing Bickerstaff or his family. Well, like, clearly, no, that's that. To be clear, I don't mean that that's naughty. What I mean that's naughty is that like whether he this has never really come up, but it's like the league has a part. Like all of this is I, I was getting. Where, like, I was yeah, getting. Yeah, that. like yeah, it's not. I don't. I just want to be clear for me that I don't think that's that's scummy. That is scummy. So the league. It hasn't been officially announced, but through The Athletic, I believe that they're going to be offering sports betting lines and parlays and all that jazz on the NBA app. And I also believe it'll be a part of League Pass as well, which, you know, they aren't going to fix the issue, but they'll pump more money into something else. And it's the nature of the beast, unfortunately. Um, Gambling is a highly addictive thing. I have people in my life that are addicted to gambling personally, and they tell me never to get into it because I have an addictive personality. And Chris is right. Like, yeah. If I get $5 to scratch and free play through my way, I use it, but I also know when to walk away. It's just the people who feel the audacity or feel the need to go out of their way to harass people, whether it's through direct messages or getting either GP Bickerstaff's, you know, I don't know if it's his work number or his private number or harassing his children because they're members of this community or just anyone like that. Like, you really... lower than the jails for you like that that's the kind of attitude i have like i don't care like if you have you lost your parlay that's the thing no one's if anyone ever says they're a professional gambler or says they have like quick tip hits or things like that they're a liar you should never take betting advice from anyone because it is all pure luck and just because your parlay didn't hit and you maybe lost on some money or something like that if you were that pressed for cash you shouldn't be gambling on sports to begin with because it is a very very deep hole and to chris's point about shohei otani his translator was like 50 million dollars or no the, the, i'm thinking about bruno mars is 50 million dollars in debt it's a hole you dig yourself in and i had someone who explained to me a family member who was addicted to gambling because i asked him like how do you ever get that bad they said oh you think you can hit one more time to get yourself out of it completely or if you've seen the movie uncut gems he literally digs himself out of the hole several times and he just decides to throw it all back in. He uses Kevin Garnett's championship ring as collateral <laughs> to replace a bet. Like it, it. I like you said. It, this is going to come up more and more often, especially with the Otani news. I think this is the biggest one, especially because it's not just him and his translator. It appears there's a lot of people within the Dodgers organization, both former and current players, that have been wrapped up in it too. Um, so maybe this is a tip of the iceberg, but sports betting has blown up like crazy, especially in Ohio since it's been legal for over a year now, but it is affiliated with every team and every league and every organization across the Rubicon because it's convenient. I can literally log in with my phone using Face ID and place a deposit to Apple Pay within seconds of this conversation. But it really just you see the human aspect of it and it just gets frustrating and I wish people who ever get to that point think like I need to step away but again I'm not going to addiction shame anyone or anything like that either but like it's also just beyond frustrating that you get to that point because you need to reevaluate your priorities and and it's also just frustrating because it's also not going to go away because sports betting is like one of the biggest financial streams for anything right now like it's so popular like it makes sense like every the Cavs have their own sports book the guardians have fanatics um the nba is doing their own thing fan duels with everyone at this point us included at locked on like yeah. it's not going to go away and it's only going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and in a society like this that is so financially driven like if they have the money to give it to you for sponsorship and advertising placement and stuff like that you're not going to say no and that's the unfortunate reality of the situation is you're more or less just going to be peddling drugs to people that are dopes and think if they win once, they can win again. So look, it, a lot I, there. Um, I, I, I have strong... I had, when I saw that, it, it made my blood boil that some on a human level, like just involving someone personally in their family is like just truly heinous behavior. 
Yeah, so like to be very, very explicit about this, that part is the part where this is not nice. That, that's where my blood boiled, so that's where I yeah. got mad. No, I, I understand that, and I think you're correct to be mad that. If I was GB Bicker stuff, I would feel a type of way about that. I would feel a type of way about it if I'm on the sideline. Eric Spoles talked about how fans yelled at him. We've seen players like pe- people will be losers and post stuff to social media, like talking to players on the court. Like, it's weird. That's weird behavior. That's not you're not you're treating them like an object, and that then in itself is weird. Where so that like to be very clear, because I want to that is not what I feel is naughty. What I think is naughty, it, what I think is inex, inextricably naughty, is that if you're JB Bickerstaff, if you are the players, you are getting like in some way, even if it is not directly, your league is your ostensible employer in the Cavs with their sportsbook with Caesars and they try to do the Fubo thing and all of that, there is money that being made for you via sports betting. This is part of the sports industry now. It is here. What I think is going to be really important is, number one, I, th- I think what Tyrese Halliburton doing talking to someone about how it makes him feel i think is really really emotionally intelligent of him i think other people should probably end up doing that number two there's going to need to be just guardrails created to protect people as much as you can you're never going to be able to solve all of this via that but i I think ways to protect the people that are being harassed is is going to be an important thing like you if jb like there's got to be ways to do some of that and there has to be ways at least to try but when this is in, in, I think inextricably for for now, you know, does does any of this ever last forever? I don't know. But as long as this stuff is around, I think it is like on it. It is or it is worth just noting to me that all of this whole thing for the teams, like you are deriving money from this in some way. So it it is just like you. Like if you feel this way, I agree. Like, but it, it and I'm not. I'm not saying that JB Bickerstaff like had his. He clearly did not like sign off on like the FanDuel NBA contract or the in-app betting in the NBA app. But there is a point where it's like this is part of your system at some point, and finding a way to like navigate that is really really difficult. So I empathize with that. But it's it's part of your world in some degree. So like I, it is just like this weird reality we're, we're living in with this. It is a weird reality. The NBA has a pretty ironclad clause that like members of the organization, whether it's players, coaches, training staff, I believe like anyone that's affiliated with like any NBA yeah. organization is allowed to participate in any it's, sports and, betting and, whatsoever. Yeah, and like most other I baseball, mean, you're allowed to bet on other sports, I know, but like yeah. most league it's like, it's pretty ironclad. Like, yeah, maybe other wanna, than LIB. Yeah. But like that's a different <laughs> That's funny money with the Saudi Arabian money, but either yeah, way. Yeah, if you want to look, the, the, the best example, one of the best examples of, I think, like that, the UFC has a policy where, like, you can, they they like you can't bet on UFC fights, like, your roommates, your spouses can't bet on them. If people want to go down, like, a rabbit hole of, like, learning about, like, a weird, how a betting thing went really, really wonky, and frankly, we don't even know the reach of fully yet, look up the James Krause situation, is what I would say. Oh, Google, Google James nuts. Krause, and you will be, like, the FBI, like, there's federals involved. We haven't gotten there with like a main like a, a big four sport yet but like the well, fact that like you have a head coach of an we, we NBA just did team. today with Shohei Otani but. yeah but I mean like we'll we'll see where that kind of like ends up but it's like that like we have not had like the 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 fixing part of it is like I think that like the 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 Krause thing was like very clear like a fixing but that's not the point the fact that you but the, the fact that from a from like our perspective you're having J.B. Bickerstaff, a head coach of the NBA team, kind of noting publicly, like, and a star player like Tyrese Halliburton and Eric Spolstra, and I, everyone can note this. I mean, like, also, we should have mentioned, like, the Maverick Carter had this issue with placing illegal bets, and that got him in some hot water this year. He's obviously uber-connected to LeBron James. This is just, like, part of the world now, and, that, that, like, navigating that, and, like, the fact that this is where this is at is, like, a, it's just... We're in uncharted waters with this on like ninety bajillion different fronts. That that is the, the the most complicated naughty part of this whole thing. It's the only complicated naughty part of this whole thing. Yeah, and I think it's fair to question the NBA and like how far are you willing to let this go when your players are getting either harassed or you know just 
or coaches are being harassed or the families of players and coaches are being harassed and like yeah there is that pretty gray line in terms of just like connections to certain to any athlete at any level um just of like how far can you go in this and stuff and like the problem is is um businesses aren't run on feelings they are run on cash and cash is king and so it's just i don't think there's going to be we're not going to really see the bottom of this um anytime soon and I, like bigger staffs admitted like somebody and somebody is going to get caught in the nba at some point it's bound to happen just because curiosity will get the better of someone no matter what but unless it's like a full blown scandal that absolutely rips us apart like it's not going away and we haven't even seen the absolute bottom of it yet but we're certainly seeing some of the ugliness from the betters and the people who are treating players or coaches like commodities instead of actual human beings. Yeah. That's the part of this. I think is just, I think everyone should be able to agree on that. If you're not treating these people like people, that's the problem. Like you can gamble, like that's not for everyone. I understand different personalities. You can like, I do, I do it sometimes you can do it and try to be and be responsible if you're approaching it in a certain way. But I think it's when you kind of morph it into I'm mad at, this person because they caught like because because i bet money on something they lost like some impossible parlay and like they're one rebound short of turning five bucks into two grand like get real man like (laughs) yeah that that like that is on you that is like a personal responsibility thing to me more than it is like a like that that is where and then you get mad like that's where it gets very icky to me i'm sure this will not be the last time this stuff comes up i'm curious to see how other coaches other teams talk about this in the coming days and weeks, how Adam Silver talks about it, how team owners talk about it in the near future. Well, that'll be covered here, everywhere, and more across Locked and NBA. We'll be back on third. We'll be back on Friday, excuse me, to get you ready for Cavs Wolves, which is a Friday game. We'll see how that matchup looks. Get you ready for that and talk some more Cavs playoff preview stuff, the latest on injuries, all that and more. And next Locked to Cavs. I'm Chris. That's Evan. Thanks again to Jake Stevens as always.